All praise to the Most High. This is your brother L. One thing that we cannot do whenever we analyze the history, the present, and the future prophecies of our people and of the whole destiny of mankind, one thing we cannot do is neglect how important trade and exchange amongst nations and peoples really is. Look at all the great civilizations that have risen and that have fallen. Look at all the civilizations that currently stand right now. And one of the seamless threads that we'll see all throughout is the principle of trade and exchange and commodities going back and forth through transactions between individuals, between countries, between nations and between peoples. One thing that we cannot neglect to do to get the full picture of where we are right now and the future of the prophetic we must not neglect the trade and the exchange and how warfare is cast through economic means. We cannot neglect to look at the power of sanctions and embargoes and economic agreements that go on on the prophetic and political stage. When we look at our history as a people, we'll find out the importance that trade and exchange has made. And it will also help us understand some of the things that are to come. Those of you brothers and sisters who may have family, who may have individuals that's close to you that consider themselves to be Moors or they follow after the, the teachings of the brother called Clarence X, who they call Father Allah. Any of the brothers and sisters you may know that's close to you, that's of the nation of Islam. Any brothers and sisters that you know that are involved in the practice of Islam, whatever the flavor of that Islamic practice may be from nation of Islam to gods and earths to five percenters all the way to those who consider themselves Shuni, Sia, whatever the case may be. I want you, if you would, to please share with them this particular discussion because we're going to tie in some things as it pertains to the Moors, as it pertains to many of the ancient empires of antiquity. And we're also going to put some, some pieces together as it pertains to prophecies that are yet to come to pass. So what I want to first do is talk about the ships of Chittim versus the ships of Tarshish. All right. Follow me on this. Let's first go to Genesis chapter 10, verse one through five. Here's what it says. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were born sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth, pay very close attention to these names. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Medai, and Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. Let's focus in on the word Magog. Remember at the beginning of the discussion where I told you, I want to focus in on my brothers and sisters that's out there in the conscious community. Those who consider themselves Moors, those who consider themselves I self law and master, those who consider themselves Islam. You know, in your Quran that it also talks about Magog and Gog. So for those of you brothers, that's of these spiritual paths that you read into the Quran, do your research about Gog and Magog. And also, when you get a chance, refer to the scriptures in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. And you'll also see that Gog and Magog get spoken of in the Bible as well as in your Quran. What you need to know, and it's why I went to these verses first, that Magog and Gog are people and land. The people descend from Japheth. And when you study the lineage of Japheth, Japheth is the Europeans, those who present day, they have a phenotype of being pale skin. They have a phenotype of the loose goats type hair that hangs down from that region that we've called Europe in the colder climates. Keep following me on this. So Gog and Magog, your Quran talks about them. The scriptures talk about them. And in both instances, it speaks of these people and this land being a people of constant warfare, constant rebellion, always bringing chaos and destruction wherever they go and whatever they touch, the descendants of the Europeans. 
So keep that in mind as I go forward. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tyrus. Also keep in mind Tyrus here. In the scripture, you'll also see Tyrus called Tyre, T-Y-R-E, that land and that people. Keep following me here. Let's read further. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz. Stop right there. Ashkenaz, the Ashkenaz Jews, the synagogue of Satan. Those who say they are Jews, but they are not, as it says in Revelation 2 and 9 and 3 and 9. We see here that Ashkenaz is also the sons of Japheth, Europeans. Now, I know a lot of my Hebrew brothers and sisters are like Brother L. We already know this. Again, I'm talking to my brothers that's in the conscious community that consider themselves Moors, that consider themselves gods and earths. That's who I'm aiming at with this discussion. I got to lay this groundwork first. So Ashkenaz is also a descendant of Japheth as well as Magog and Gog. Keep following. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Rephath and Togarma. Now let's key in on what is about to be read next. And the sons of Javan, Elisha and Tarshish and Kittim. Let's stop right there. So the sons of Japheth, one of the sons of Japheth was Javan, and he had sons named Tarshish and Kittim. That's the basis of what we're going to be speaking about when you see in the title, the ships of Tarshish versus the ships of Chittim. And we're going to look at the history of the trade route of the great civilizations from Egypt to Assyria, to Babylon, all these empires, and even the current day world and how trade is still going on through these same routes and through these same nations. The global economy is held up by the exchange and the trade amongst nations. Those of you who are into the history of the Moors, you already know about the Silk Road. You know about the trade routes. You know about Mansa Musa and how he became the wealthiest melanated man ever to walk the earth because he capitalized on those trade routes being opened up. And by the end of this discussion, you're going to understand that the Messiah, Yeshua Hamashiach, the dark bronze skinned king who is to come, he will be as and greater than Mansa Musa was. And I'm going to show you in the scriptures how all those ancient trade routes are going to open right back up. And the ships of Tarshish and the ships of Chittim play a role, good and bad, in the future empire that is to be set up where the melanated peoples will rise back to the top again. Hallelujah. So let's read this one more. And the sons of Javan, Elisha and Tarshish and Kittim, key in on Tarshish and Kittim and Dodanum. And by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongues, after their families in their nations. What I would suggest those of you who are listening do to get even more detailed understanding on this. Check out a video in my archive called uh, they they cast lots to part the land and the righteous seed shall inherit the earth. In that discussion, I go even deeper into how, how the earth was divided up through lots into what bloodlines and peoples owned certain real estate on the planet. But for this one, we're going to focus in on Tarshish and Chittim. Okay. Now, so now we know that Tarshish and Chittim are sons of Japheth. Now, when you look on a map, especially the ancient maps, what you will find is that the land of Tarshish is what we presently call Spain today. Right there at the tip of Spain and another North African country that those of you brothers and sisters who consider yourself Moors are very familiar with. Morocco. Morocco. So the area in scripture that was called Tarshish was a, a trade route, an ancient trade route where much of the gold, the silver, the linens, the silks, all of the trade items of antiquity that enrich nations and civilizations, especially in the days of Solomon. And I'm going to get to that because Solomon traded with a man named Hiram, king of Tyree. And we're going to talk about how the ships of Tarshish were coming to bring a lot of the wealth and the wealth of the kings of Arabia on these trade routes. 
and the same trade routes that were open when the black King Solomon was reigning on the earth are going to be the same trade routes when the black king Yeshua Hamashiach sets up his empire and many of those same trade routes that made Solomon the wealthiest king on earth the same trade routes that made Mansa Musa the wealthiest king on earth are going to make the Messiah and the Hebrews the wealthiest on earth in that time by these same trade routes hallelujah now Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 27 because one thing we also need to understand is that these trade routes were not only just used for economy, wealth, and warfare, they were also used for nations to fight against one another. Those same trade routes, because think about it, it's the same thing as any ghetto in America. If you want to rob the dude that got the money, you're going to pay attention to the routes that he takes. You're going to find out where he gets his shipments at. You're going to find out uh, when that weight is going to get delivered so you can cut off the route, get him for the work, and then you sell it back into the community through the same routes, but the money coming back to you. So they did the same thing in ancient times through warfare is to cut off a lot of these trade routes. That's how many nations became enriched by cutting off trade routes and conquering the lands around those trade routes. Okay. And what the Messiah is going to do is reconquer those lands because we got gentrifiers and squatters in our land right now that's clogging up our ancient trade routes. That's how the slave trades and all those things happen through many of these ancient trade routes through the ships of Chittim and the ships of Tarshish. Now, Jeremiah 51, 27, listen to what it says about the nations of war that operate on these trade routes. It says, set ye up a standard in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations, prepare the nations against her, call uh, together against her the kingdoms of Ararat, many and Ashkenaz. Appoint a captain against her and cause the horses to come up as the rough caterpillars. So here we're seeing that the prophecy from Jeremiah is that the Ashkenaz, the false Jews, would be a part of clogging up these ancient trade routes to bring warfare to the world. It's right here in Jeremiah 51, 27. The sons of Japheth, Ashkenaz, Gog, Magog, they will be a big part in these final wars that are to come. It says it right there in Jeremiah 51, 27. Now, let's tie in the slave rate, the slave trade routes as it pertains to the ships of Chittim. Let's go to Numbers chapter 24, verse 24. Listen to the prophecy that was made, and this was millennia before the Arabic slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade took place, where it prophesied that the sons of Japheth would be a part of this. Numbers chapter 24, verse 24, it says, and ships shall come from the coast of Chittim. That's right, the same Chittim that is the sons of Japheth. And ships shall come from the coast of Chittim and shall afflict Asher and shall afflict Eber. And he also shall perish forever. So the people of Chittim, the sons of Japheth, it says that ships, those slave ships and those warships would afflict the Assyrians and would afflict the Eberites, which are also the Hebrews. And when we look through history, we see how that took place. The ships of Chittim. This was the prophecy. And we saw that manifest when we looked at the transatlantic slave trade. We saw that manifest when we looked at the Arabic slave trade. It was those ships of Chittim that were taking our people to the various areas to put us in servitude. It was the ships of Chittim that took us to the four corners of the earth. It was the ships of Chittim that caused the, Deut the Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 uh, curse to come to be and the most high shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships with what ships the ships of Chittim by the way whereof I spake unto thee thou shalt see it no more again and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen and no man shall buy you so it was those ships of Chittim that were used for warfare against us and to enslave us remember that and remember that Chittim or the Katim is the sons of Japheth. And he has a near 
cousin called Ashkenaz, the Ashkenazi Jews. And he has another near cousin. Whenever you read Joshua chapter 90, verse one through nine, he has another near distant relative. Those we call the descendants of Japheth and Esau mixing together, the bastards. When you look up the word mixed in the scripture, mixed, the word that's rendered is Arab, A-R-A-B, Arab. That's right. Jasher chapter 90 verse 1 through 9 lets us know that Esau and the sons of Japheth or the Katim, the sons of Chittim, they mix together into one bloodline and the word mixed in scripture is Arab. That's why a lot of you brothers that's gods and earths, a lot of you brothers that's nation of Islam or Moors, you were taught by a lot of your elders to beware of the pale skin Arab because many of the pale skin Arabs over there in the land right now are of the seed of Japheth and Esau. They're a mixture. They're, they're a hybrid bastard race. And you see what's going on with them and the false Jews over there. So what we have to start paying attention to is what's going on with the Turks. What's going on with the Saudi Arabians? What's going on with the false Jews? And we have to look at some of these ancient trade routes and what is to come when we talk about currency and how this last government that will rise will implement currency that will enslave nations. No man will be able to buy or sell without this currency. No man will be able to trade and exchange resources without this currency. And we're going to go back to what took place with King Solomon whenever he was doing business with the king of Tyree. And we're going to look at the mystery behind the king of Tyree as it's written in the book of Ezekiel. We're going to tie all this in together. Work with me. So now we've just found out who Kittim is and how the ships of Kittim is responsible for bringing all our people into all these different slave trades to the four corners of the earth. And we also want to look at how the ships of Kittim and the people of Kittim have been responsible for many warfares in the past and they will be in the future as well. Daniel chapter 11, let's read it, starting at verse 27. It says, and both these kings' heart shall be to do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. And at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter. Listen to this. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. So this dictator and this king that is to rise. It's talking about how the ships of Chittim will also be a part of the final wars that are fought by this king and against this king. So the ships of Chittim have a role all the way from our ancient history on through those slave ships of Chittim, those war ships of Chittim. And I'm going to talk about the balance between the ships of Chittim and the ships of Tarshish in a moment. Just hang with me. So listen to what it says about that king. He says he shall have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. So the scripture is saying right there at that time when all this is going on, that many of the righteous will be purged. You always hear folks talking about the purge. Well, in scripture, that is the purge that will take place where the righteous and the remnant will be purged to try them and to make them stronger. For it says here, it says they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity. That's what Daniel prophesied about many of us going into captivity. And by spoil many days and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them. So throughout history, the most high has used these warships of Chittim and the slave ships of Chittim. 
Now, we're going to see that the tide is eventually going to turn and that it's going to be the ships of Chittim that get destroyed. And we have to talk about how the ships of Tarshish will play a role in that. For, before we do, though, let's go to the book War Scroll, also called Sons of Light versus Sons of Darkness, where it talks about the fall of the sons of Chittim. It says, when the exiles of the sons of light returned from the wilderness of the peoples to camp in the wilderness of Jerusalem, then after the battle, they shall go up from that place and tile the king of the Kittim. That's the people of Kittim again, the sons of Japheth, the brothers of Ashkenaz and uh, the, the brothers of the, the pale skinned Arabs. And it says, and tile king of the Kittim shall enter into Egypt in his time, he shall go forth with great wrath to do battle against the kings of the north. And in his anger, he shall shed out to destroy and eliminate the strength of Israel. So what's prophesied here in War Scroll chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 directly ties in with what we just read in Daniel chapter 11. Because it's talking about the king of the north versus the king of the south. It's talking about the area up there by Turkey. And it's talking about the area down south. Over there by Edom, down there by Saudi Arabia, by Mecca. That's the areas it's talking about. King of the North versus King of the South. All right. It says, then after the battle, they shall go up from that place and tile. King of the Katim shall enter into Egypt. In his time, he shall go forth with great wrath to do battle against the kings of the North. And in his anger, he shall set out to destroy and eliminate the strength of Israel. Then there shall be a time of salvation for the people of Yah and a time of dominion for all the men of his forces and eternal annihilation for all the forces of Belial. Listen to this. There shall be great panic among the sons of Japheth. Who are those sons of Japheth? The ones I just got reading about at the beginning of the discussion. Gog, Magog, Ashkenaz, Chittim, those sons of Japheth. War scroll here is telling us at the time that there is salvation for the melanated people, the chosen people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, at the same time we are delivered, that is a time of great panic for the sons of Japheth. That's why you see a lot of these uh, folks that's of the white, uh, the, the white weakness community. I'll never say white supremacy because they not, are not supreme. The white weakness community, they are in a panic. You see them opening up these detention centers. You see them trying to put forth all this white nationalism. That's because they are in a panic. They know that the rise of the melanated sons of the most high is to come. And the book war scroll is prophesying this very same thing. It says there shall be great panic among the sons of Japheth. Assyria shall fall with no one to come to his aid and the supremacy of the Katim shall cease that wickedness be overcome without a remnant. So the scriptures are even prophesying the destruction of white supremacy. Right here in War Scroll chapter one, verse six, for it says the supremacy of the Katim shall cease. And I just traced the genealogy of the Katim. They're sons of Japheth, sons of the pale skins. And that also applies to those that mixed with Esau, the half breed pale skin Arabs. That applies to them too. The supremacy of the Katim shall cease. The, the supremacy of the Ashkenaz Jew shall cease. Hallelujah. That's what War Scroll chapter 1 verse 6 is prophesying. The sons of Japheth, Assyria shall fall with no one to come to his aid. And the supremacy of the Katim shall cease. That wickedness be overcome without a remnant. There shall be no survivors of all the sons of darkness. All right. Hallelujah. So we're going to see the destruction of Chittim. We're going to see the destruction of Ashkenaz. We're going to see the destruction of the ships of Chittim. Let's go to 2nd Ezra chapter 13 verse 1 through 13. I'm going to read this because it talks about how the Messiah is going to wage war on the nations. You can precept this also with Revelation chapter 19. And then I'm going to go into the history of the trade routes of the ships of Chittim and Tarshish and how the ships of Tarshish will play a role in the end days. Now, here's, here we go. Second Edges 13, starting at verse one, it says, 
And it came about after seven days that in the night I dreamed a dream and behold, a wind arose from the sea so that it stirred up all its waves. And I looked and behold, the wind brought out of the heart of the sea, something like the figure of a man. And this man flew with the clouds of heaven and wherever he turned his face to look, everything that was seen by him trembled. And wherever the voice went from his mouth, all who heard his voice melted as wax melts when it fills the fire. And after that, I looked and behold, an innumerable multitude of men was gathered together from the four winds of heaven to make war upon the man who had come up out of the sea. And I looked and behold, he carved himself out a great mountain and flew up upon it. But I sought to see the region or place from which the mountain had been carved and I could not. And after that, I looked and behold, all who had gathered together against him to fight with him were much afraid, but dared to fight. And behold, when he saw the onset of the multitude that approached, he did not raise his hand or hold a sword or any weapon of war. But I saw only how he sent out of his mouth what looked like a flood of fire and out of his lips a flaming breath. And from his tongue, he sent forth a storm of sparks. These were all mixed together, the flood of fire and the flaming breath and the mighty storm. And it fell upon the onset of the multitude, which was ready to fight and burned them all up. So that suddenly there was nothing to be seen of the countless multitude, but the dust of their ashes and the smell of smoke. And when I saw it, I was amazed. So this is the Messiah conquering the armies that come before him. And those armies we know are the armies of Psalm 83. We know it's the sons of Esau and Ishmael. We also know it, that it's the army that Jeremiah spoke of in Jeremiah 51, 27, the Turks, the Ottomans, the uh, people of Chittim, those also are going to be joined in that group that the Messiah is slaughtering. He's going to be slaughtering the pale skinned Arab and he's going to be slaughtering many of these Ishmaelites. Hallelujah. It says, after I saw this man come down from the mountain and call to him another multitude that was peaceable, then many people came to him, some joyful, some sorrowful, some in fetters and some bringing offerings. So there it's saying that after the Messiah conquers those armies, it said that different groups of people is going to be coming to him. It said some is going to be brought to him in chains as slaves and others is going to be brought to him happy, joyful and bringing offerings to him. Now, let's find out about more of the people that will be coming to him bringing offerings and let's talk more about those that will be coming to him as slaves and brought into captivity. For we know in Revelation that it says those who uh, are destined to the sword to the sword, those who are destined to captivity to captivity. And we cannot neglect, as I said at the beginning of the discussion, we cannot neglect the importance of those ancient trade routes opening back up whenever the Messiah's empire is put back on top, just like Mansa Musa, just like Genghis Khan, just like all these mighty leaders and emperors, the Ottoman empire, when they reigned in those areas at the apex of their power, those trade routes were popping. Those trade routes were opened up to bring everything from slaves to silver and gold, all that. And I'm going to show you how that's going to open right back up when the Messiah and the people of the Most High is put back in power. Now, let's go back to the days of Solomon. First Kings chapter 10, verse 14 through 15. Listen to what it says here. It says, now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year, this is very interesting, was 666 talents of gold. Ain't that interesting? Beside that, he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. So Solomon, when he opened the trade route, he ordered them to bring him 666 talents of gold. And it said that the kings of Arabia and those that was around him was the ones bringing in this gold. Now, we know that Solomon went left into some. Um, some dark mysticism. And in Daniel chapter 11, it also talks about the anti-Messiah, the final world dictator that is to come. He will also be involved in some of the same stuff that Solomon was involved in. Some of the, uh, it said he will be a king of dark sentences, dark sentences, meaning some of that ancient knowledge, the same knowledge that Nimrod possessed of the codes and the, uh, the words of power 
to where he can manifest wealth. So they are able on the dark left hand path to manifest wealth through certain spells. Now, I'm not saying that's the only way to manifest wealth. I'm just letting you know what they do on the left hand side. So these trade routes where they brought in a lot of this wealth, Solomon was overseeing that. And the ships that was bringing him this wealth and these servants and all these things was the ships of Tarshish. All right. You can also find that in first Kings chapter five, verse one through 11 about the ships of Tarshish and how they were bringing some of the wealth that helped build up Solomon's temple and make him the wealthiest king on earth at that time. And you'll read about a man named Hiram who was king of Tyre and how they used the ships of Tarshish. Remember the same ships of Tarshish that I talked about that came from Morocco and Spain, the same area where a lot of you brothers say the Moors was setting up shop long before they was ruling over there in Europe. The Moors over there in Spain and Morocco were sending ships to King Solomon. Hallelujah. Now, you got a lot of brothers and sisters that say the Moors are actually Israelites and that they was Northern Kingdom Israelites. You got others that say they was Israelites who just defected to Islam whenever those 10 tribes went to Assyria and mingled in with all those peoples. I'm not here to agree or disagree with none of that. Because I do know that a lot of our people went up there into those areas, up there into the area of the north, up there by Turkey, up there. And they started mixing and mingling with those bloodlines. All I know is that the ships of Tarshish was bringing in traffic from Morocco, Spain, and bringing the gold and the silver to Solomon. 666 talents of all the wealth, bringing it to King Solomon in those days. Now, what's interesting, when you look at a lot of the things that the Freemasons believe, they hold up this man Hiram in high regard. In their text, they call him Hiram Abif. Okay? What's interesting is, when we look at the scriptures, we also see in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 1 through 18, that Satan is also called the king of Tyre. And that Satan is also responsible for the traffic of wealth and riches all throughout the earth. As it says in the book of Job, the earth has been given into the hand of the wicked. So a lot of these ancient trade routes that are enriching the Saudi Arabians, that are enriching the false Jews, these are the trade routes that actually belong to us, but it's given into the hand of the spirit of Satan, also called the king of Tyre. Okay? So to understand this in simple terms, the wealth of the Saudi Arabians actually belongs to the Hebrew. The wealth of the false Jews actually belongs to the Hebrew. The wealth of the Romans actually belongs to the Hebrew. So the wealth that you see the Vatican and the Pope and the Romans, the wealth that you see the Saudi Arabians and Mecca, the wealth that you see the false Jews have, all that truly belongs to the sons of Abraham, the sons of Isaac and the sons of Jacob. That is our wealth. You see how great the city of Dubai is right now and how celebrities and billionaires flock to Dubai. That's how it's going to be in the kingdom whenever the Messiah is ruling in Jerusalem. It says the kingdom and the temple of the Messiah, everybody from all over the earth will be going there. That's how majestic, that's how wealthy that we're going to be in that time that all the nations will flock to us and all those ancient trade routes that the ships of Tarshish used to bring the wealth to King Solomon, those same trade routes are going to be opened back up. And this anti-Messiah that is to come, he's going to try to equal the glory of a lot of the ancient kings like Mansa Musa, like Solomon. So when he rises to power, you're going to see a lot of these ancient trade routes open back up because that's the spirit of the king of Tyre that the Most High told Ezekiel to prophesy against in Ezekiel 28, verse 1 through 18. Check it out. It says, The word of the Most High get came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Most High, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Let's stop right there. So 
that's a message to a lot of you brothers and sisters that's talking about I'm God, I'm God. A lot of you brothers and sisters in the conscious community and those who follow after a lot of the uh, tenets of I self law and master, things like that. I understand that when a lot of y'all say that I am God, you mean it that you are the master of your destiny, that through your decisions and through your wisdom and through your understanding, you create your own life. In that sense, it's true. But you must be careful because we Hebrews, we never say we are God. We just say we are gods, lowercase gods. It's a difference between you saying I am a God and you saying I am a God. Here we see that this spirit of the king of Tyree, the most high is against him because he says, I am God. And that's the same thing that the Antichrist to come is going to do, sit in the temple and as God say that he is God. So y'all have to be careful with that spirit of walking around here talking about I'm God because the most high here is going to judge that spirit that says that it says, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thy heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thy understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. So, the prophet Ezekiel is prophesying against this spirit of the king of Tyree that number one, he has blocked off all the ancient trade routes and made himself wealthy by it. And number two, he says that he is God. That is the spirit that we dealing with, with Islam, with Judaism and with the Christianity. They've cut off the ancient trade routes and they've enriched themselves. And we're going to find out what is the main object that they trafficked. That the Most High is angry with them for trafficking. Most of you already know who and what that object is that the Father is going to hold them guilty for trafficking. And we're going to find out what wealth and what objects it is that has made them rich. It says, Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit and thou shalt die the depths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God, but thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. So the father is saying, I'm going to bring death and destruction to y'all. And when I bring death and destruction, you're not going to be saying that you God then. Listen to what he says. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Most High. Moreover, the word of the Most High came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Most High, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Yah. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The worksmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of Yah. Thou wast walk up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of Yah, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. So the father is mad at Satan and the king of Tyree for his trafficking, for his trafficking, for him cutting off those ancient trade routes. And for him trafficking the bodies and souls of his people. He says, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee and it shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So that same area of Tyree, look at it on the map. 
you'll see it's not too far from the same area the Messiah said is the seat of Satan, the king of Tyre, the seat of Satan over there in the area where the Nicolaitans brought forth the doctrine that the Messiah hated. The, the same area that Ezekiel was told to prophesy against. Hallelujah. That same area is what is spoken of here in Ezekiel 28, where this king that cut off the trafficking routes and trafficked the Most High's people as captives and slaves, that same area. All right. That same area, whenever you go to the archive and listen to my discussion, the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, that same area up there that the Messiah was telling our people is the seat of Satan by Pergamum, Pergamos, that same region. That's what Ezekiel is prophesying against as well. The king of Tyre. Now let's go to Joel chapter three, verse two through eight, and let's see what is the riches that the father is angry at them for trafficking. Throughout the world, it says, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon and all the coast of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Listen to this, because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Greeks that ye might remove them far from their border. So the father is angry at the nations for not only taking his silver and his gold, but us. His people, we are the riches that they have been trafficking to the four corners of the earth. We are the ones that they put on the ships of Chittim and took us to all four corners of the earth, sold us to the Greeks, sold us to the Assyrians, sold us back into Egypt, sold us to the Americans. And listen to the judgment that the father is going to bring on them. He says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place where the ye have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off for the most high have spoken it. So what the scripture is prophesying here is that the same ships of Chittim that trafficked us to all four corners of the earth like you see them with the human trafficking and the organ trafficking and the sex trafficking that they do right now, all that wickedness is going to be turned right back on their own head. And when the Messiah returns, he's going to open up those trade routes again, except it's going to be our enemies that are being sold into slavery to the four corners of the earth to serve our people. And those same trade routes that they stole our riches, they're going to have to use those same trade routes to bring all our silver and all our gold right back to us. The Saudi Arabians are going to have to bring it back. The Turks are going to have to bring it back. The Egyptians are going to have to bring it back. Those over there in Morocco and Spain, the Romans and the Greeks, they're going to have to bring back all that wealth. The British royal family, they're going to have to bring back all that wealth through the same trade, trade routes through the same slave ship routes that they trafficked us, they're going to have to use those same routes to bring everything right back to us. How do I know? Isaiah chapter 60, verse 8 through 18. Listen to what it says about the ships of Tarshish bringing these things back to the land. It says, who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the most high thy Elohim. So the father here, it's a reversal. It's a, it's a divine justice. Just like the ships of Chittim made war on us and spread us to the four corners of the earth as slaves. Guess what's going to happen? The ships of Chittim are going to be destroyed and the ships of Tarshish are going to have to bring back all our wealth and all our people. Just like they sent us away on ships, 
They're going to have to bring us back on the same ships to the land. And that's what it's talking about in second Ezra chapter 13, that it's going to be them brought back as slaves and us be brought back in freedom. They're going to be the ones in second Ezra 13 that are brought back in chains and fetters. And we are going to be the ones coming back joyful, bringing offerings to the most high and the Messiah. It says it right here in Isaiah chapter 60. He says, surely the isles shall wait for me. The same isles that we talked about in Genesis 10, the isles of the Gentiles, surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the most high thy Elohim and to the Holy One of Israel, because he have glorified thee and the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls and their king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath, I smote thee, but in my favor, have I had mercy on thee. So this is prophesying the return to the throne of the black man, the melanated man. This is the return to the throne of the Hebrew. Hallelujah. This is the return to the throne of the sons of Jacob. And just like in the days of Solomon, where the ships of Tarshish was bringing us uh, servants and bringing us silver and gold, they're going to be doing that again. Hallelujah. Therefore, thy gates shall be opened continually. They shall not be shut day nor night that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. So any nation that refuses to serve us and be our servants, we will slaughter them. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the fine tree, and the box tree together to beautify, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. So just like in Islam, they behead their enemies that refuse to serve them. We're going to have that same power to slaughter the enemies and the nations who refuse to serve us. We will rule with an iron rod and we will have all the wealth returned back to us. And just like our people left on ships, they will have to bring us back on the ships of Tarshish. And it says, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the most high, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shall suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the most high, am thy savior and thy redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. For brass, I will bring gold and for iron, I will bring silver and for wood, brass and for stones, iron. I will also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. So in the scripture, it says that when we return to the land, there will be no more violence. That's how you know that Japheth is dwelling in the tents of Shem right now and that the Europeans and the uh, Esau Japheth half breeds and pale skinned Arabs is dwelling in the tents of Shem right now because all it is is violence. But when we return, there will be no violence. Hallelujah. Now. Let's see how the Most High is going to bring this thing full circle as it pertains to the Assyrians and the Egyptians, because we know that one of the first captivities, captivities our people went in was the Assyrian captivity. That's when the northern ten tribes went uh, up there. And it also prophesies about that in the book of Second Ezra. Whenever you read uh, chapter 13 and you read verse 39, Listen to what it says. It says, and as for your seeing him gather about himself another multitude that was peaceable. These are the 10 tribes that in the days of King Hosea were carried away from their own land into captivity, whom Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, made captive and carried beyond the river. So the Assyrian captivity was one of the first captivities of our people. One of the first. And it was one of the most famous captivities the Assyrian captivity and the Egyptian captivity. Now let's see how the Most High is going to bring that all back full circle, just like he's going to do with the ships of Tarshish. Listen to how he's going to turn the captivity of the Assyrians and the Egyptians. 
Let's go to Isaiah chapter 19, verse 20 through 25. It says, and it shall be a sign and for a witness unto the most high of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they shall cry unto the most high because of the oppressors and he shall send them a savior and a great one and he shall deliver them and the most high shall be known to Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the most high in that day and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the most high and perform it. So this scripture is saying that there will be Egyptians that are serving the Hebrews in the kingdom. It says, and the most high shall smite Egypt. He shall smite it and heal it. And they shall return even to the most high and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria and the Egyptian shall serve with the Assyrians. So there it's saying that the Messiah is going to open back up the Silk Road, the same Silk Road that the Moors trafficked on, the same Silk Road that Mansa Musa used that made him the wealthiest man on earth. So a lot of you brothers out there that say you are Moors, a lot of you brothers out there that follow after the Egyptology, understand we of the Hebrew way, we understand the importance of the Egyptian empires, the Assyrian empires. We understand the importance of the Moors. We understand that. And we, what we want to show you is that in the Messiah's kingdom, when the black man, the melanated man rises back up to power, we are going to be keeping the laws and commands of the most high of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I want you to see here that the Egyptians, the Assyrians, and the Israelites are all going to be close together. And the Egyptians and Assyrians will serve unto the Israelites. So we're not neglecting that Egypt was a great people and a great nation. A lot of y'all think that us Hebrews just totally say Egypt wasn't nothing. Egypt wasn't about nothing. No, we realize Egypt was a great civilization. We understand that the Egyptians taught Moses many things. We understand that uh, Joseph taught the Egyptians many things when he was there. We have to understand it's always been a dynamic of trade and interaction and traffic amongst Hebrews and Egyptians, amongst Hebrews and Assyrians. So what we're trying to tell you is that in the kingdom, in our kingdom, we're going to open back up that trade and that trafficking. We will be in power, but we're not here to negate that Egypt or Assyria was powerful. A lot of the brothers and sisters in the conscious community get that messed up that we don't honor Egypt. No, we realize that we as a people, the Hebrews, we were made a nation in Egypt. We understand that Joseph, one of our greatest ones, was married to an Egyptian woman. We understand that. So our law and command tell us thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian. So we don't hate the Egyptian civilization. We don't we're not against y'all brothers for talking about Egypt this, Egypt that. But what we're not going to do is get into polytheism and worship many gods. We, we don't want to go back to Egypt. We want to go to our kingdom. That's why we don't follow the ways of the Egyptians. We follow the ways of our true ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And by doing that, we will be put back in power. That's what we be trying to tell y'all. But we're not here to get in no battles and ego battles or none of that. We want to prepare ourselves to traffic amongst each other once again. So those ancient trade routes can open back up. And instead of the European or the pale skin Arab being on top, it's going to be us on top. So ain't that beautiful how the Most High is going to bring all this full circle? Just like the Egyptians and the Assyrians put us in captivity, it will be them serving us. Just like they blocked off all the ancient trade routes and they're using it for wickedness right now and they used it to spread us all throughout four corners of the earth. It's going to be poetic justice where those same trade routes, they're going to be the ones getting sold as slaves on those trade routes. And the same routes that they stole our people and stole our wealth by, the same ships they used, the ships of Tarshish is going to bring those riches right back. And the ships of Tarshish is going to bring our people right back, gathering us from the four winds of heaven to bring us back into the land to where the kingdom will be rebuilt and the Messiah will rule from sea to sea and have dominion over all ends of the earth. And most high will the remnant of us that endure to the end and are accepted and approved of him. We will reign right by his side, ruling with an iron rod. Hallelujah. Shalom.